So hello and welcome to the second section of our Amakitia Clarinet Extravaganza Weekend. Hello, great to have you here. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce our wonderful guest panelist and personal friend, Maury Bakun, who is founder and president of Bakun Musical Services, which was formed in 2000. It's been said that Maury was born with a clarinet in one hand and a reamer in the other, and he is known around the world for his exquisite craftsmanship of handcrafted barrels, bells, clarinets, and mouthpieces, and his sense of humor. As the go-to woodwind technician for many of the world's most respected artists, we're very pleased to have Maury with us for this important discussion on how to take care of our precious clarinet points. Hello, everyone. Good morning for those of you where it's morning, it's the afternoon, good afternoon, and for those of you who may be from overseas, hope you're having a great evening. When I was asked to do this session, uh, I was trying to figure out a few things in terms of what might be helpful to people during this time of COVID, where it may not be easy to go and see a technician or to have your instruments attended to. So I'm going to try and give you some handy hints and little tips that you can do at home. Uh, and we're going to open the floor to any questions about clarinets. Doesn't matter whether it's mechanical, it can be acoustical or voicing, choosing equipment, uh, how you use it, different things. So a couple of just little beginning snippets. First of all, for those of you that do not know, it is Diane Barger's birthday. So let's all virtually say happy birthday to a great clarinetist and a great clarinet teacher and a great member of the clarinet community. Thank you so much. Bravo. Thank you. So part of the reason I wanted to talk to you about some helpful maintenance tips and things that you're able to do, you know, as technicians, we tend to see a lot of things and people tend to think of going to a technician for all kinds of major work. They've dropped their instrument and a tenon's broken. They need a complete overhaul. They have mechanical rattles and all kinds of things they can't do. But interestingly, Technicians tend to see all kinds of things. So I'm going to tell a little story, and this involves part of the reason that you want to look after your instrument. So there is a very well-respected, very well-known artist and teacher from the southern United States. So I will give you a clue. They're in one of the 20, hey, one of the 20 states in the southern part of the United States. One day I'm sitting in my office and I get a panic-stricken phone call. It's not unusual to get a panic-stricken phone call from a player, but this one, hi, Maury, it's about a week from now and I've got my big recital and my clarinet just stopped working. It just stopped, nothing's working. It's kind of unusual that something like that happens where it just stops. So we talked a little bit about what it could be and you know, check the screw on the A and the G sharp key, look inside and make sure there's not a dime stuck in there, um, check some air suction and different things that you could do. We tried all those kind of handy things and there was just no getting back. And this particular player wasn't comfortable going to a local shop with their high-end instrument, uh, just in the area that they're in, there wasn't that person. So we ascertained the best thing would be for them to send it to Vancouver. So they dutifully arranged a box. They packed it up by FedEx Air Express and sent it. And I think it was about $250 just to ship it to Vancouver. It came to Vancouver. We looked at it and we're checking for cracks and all kinds of things. And we have this fancy machine for air pressure where instead of sucking on the instrument or blowing in it, particularly in these days of COVID may not be a good idea. We use this machine. And when we put the upper joint on the machine, it was leaking like crazy. So I'm looking all over the place and suddenly under the throat A key, I saw something that looked a little suspicious. So I reached in with tweezers and I pulled it out and it was a wiry dog hair. I put it back on the machine and the needle basically went down pretty much to zero, which means that it was perfect. So between shipping it to Vancouver and shipping it back, I think the person spent about $500 to remove a dog hair. I tell you this because one of the things that you can all do while you're stuck in the house at home uh, with these COVID times is virtually everybody has a vacuum. Once a month, vacuum your case, take all the junk out. 
you know, we, we forget this, but in normal times, our case is all over the place. It's in band room floors. It's in teaching studios. It may be in a church. It's in your, your dorm room. It can be in a library. Who knows what's there? The other thing which I've seen many times are bugs inside cases where they get in, and especially if you have bladder pads or cork pads, they start burrowing away and causing all kinds of problems. You know, I'm very fortunate. I drive a really nice car, and a lot of it is because you don't vacuum your cases. So if you want, if you want to make sure that I don't drive as nice a car next time, folks, once a month, just vacuum your case. It's so simple to do. If you do that, you will not suffer that same problem where a week before your recital or your big audition, because it always happens at the worst possible time. You go to play your solo on stage and nothing comes out. So I'm going to talk about some little helpful hints, but that story is to simply illustrate even to top players, top teachers, things like that happen. Okay. So a few things which you can do while you're all at home with all of this extra time on your hands, you can't be going to parties. You can't necessarily be going out and socializing the way we do. Um, you've watched almost everything there is on Netflix. Basically, at this point, you've cleaned your kitchen three times. There are a few things you can basically do to take care of your own instrument. So the first thing is, I'm gonna use, just uh, let me grab a clarinet. So in your clarinet, when we play, we have all kinds of dust, dirt, lint that's there. I've had countless top professionals come to me, fly to Vancouver, from as far as Asia to say that they have notes that are out of tune or they have notes that are stuffy. And in many cases, on the open holes and particularly on the thumb hole, there's an accumulation of dirt and dust. And if you look at your own clarinets, I'll bet you're gonna see it. So what you all need, if you can get it, this is a very expensive, incredibly exotic tool. I can see some people nodding and some guys who are on this particular call who have kind of a blank look on their face. This is a mascara brush. So mascara brushes are meant to be used near the eye. They're very, very gentle. There's not sharp parts. So the easiest way to clean, I find these are better than Q-tips or cotton buds because they tend to leave lint. So a lot of the time, the reason that there's an accumulation in the tone holes is we use cork grease and the cork grease is waxy. It gets caught up. So it's very much like mascara. I suggest for all of you, you get a bottle of eye makeup remover. Now this is Lancome. You don't really need to use a name brand expensive Lancome, but it so happens I'm working from my house at this point. So I went in and stole um, whatever I could find from Mary's cabinet, but you can go to a drugstore and buy a really inexpensive eye makeup remover. They're all gentle. You simply dip the brush, and then in each hole, you want to go in and clean it. And it's good if you have two brushes because the second one is dry. And then go down. It takes about 10 or 15 seconds per tone hole. And you will be amazed in many cases that notes that were stuffy, notes where there were certain flatness in them or not responsive at the difference. In the metal one, it seems to attract all kinds. Okay. The other thing you can do with that, this takes a little more bravery, but if you have notes where suddenly you're getting all kinds of water in the tone holes, one of the main reasons water gets in tone holes, there are a few of them, but one of them is that dirt and debris builds up inside the actual key. So if you are comfortable undoing the key, you can also I'm going to try this fancy, handy little electric screwdriver. And then even if you don't have a pair of smooth pliers, you can use tweezers for pulling it out. The shaft comes out. Please put it somewhere it doesn't roll away. You take the key off, put it down, and then exactly the same technique inside the tone hole. And the typical places where you get water in most clarinets are the side trill keys, the front C sharp, G sharp, 
and sometimes in the throat A and B flat. Often as well in the register key because the register key, and I will take this off just to show you, has a little tiny metal tube on almost every make of clarinet. So if you look, you'll see how tiny that one is. Just a little bit of dust in there will be the difference between ow and wow. It is amazing to me that about half of the clarinets I see from players who complain about tonguing in the upper register being more difficult, doing diminuendos, particularly in the altissimo, being more difficult, are because of that tube being blocked. So again, a little eye makeup remover. And if you don't have eye makeup remover, you can do it dry. And I find if you hold it this way, when you pull it out, the gravity will help with everything falling away. Okay. Just because we're talking about it right now, the other thing you can do, the thumb tube, this is the note that you press if you were playing a thumb F. In many cases, if you look inside your clarinet, so you look up into a light, there are a few different kinds of tubes, but one of them is flat on the bottom. If it's flat, it's equal all the way around. But many of them look like the shape of a U or a horseshoe. If you look in your clarinet, and that is slightly sideways, it causes all kinds of resistance problems. Probably 80% of the clarinets I look at have that problem. So while you may not have a tool where you can move it at home, you should be aware of that. And if so, the next time you go into a shop, usually they're set in place with either wax or paraffin or with shellac. So there's gentle heat applied and then you can turn it sideways. When it lines up, as you can imagine, if it's sideways, it makes it much harder for the air to pass it. So it makes it much more resistant. You notice on B over the break and on certain tonguing, particularly in the right hand seems to be affected by that. The other way you can tell is often when you play a thumb F to G, just a half note legato, mezzo forte to forte, you hear the F as being kind of dull and you hit the G and suddenly there's a whole different resonance and resistance to it. That's usually a pretty good indication that you have a problem of that type, okay? Now, the reason the tubes block up are in many cases, just the saliva we blow, you need to remember it's not water, it's acid, so it's corrosive. When we blow, there's food particles, and, and for those of you that didn't clean your case, although I know you all will now, all of that stuff goes into your clarinet. But the biggest culprit for that, let me just do this, is, For some of you, I know I've done classes for Denise before, and I think Diane's been at some that I've done. <clears throat> this is your swab. I know that during times of COVID, we're all thinking much more carefully than we normally might about germs and dust and dirt and debris and all kinds of things. But typically, I find all kinds of clarinet players who have swabs that are older than their pets. Some of their children, and in many cases have survived three marriages where they've never been washed. So I suggest that at least once a month, your swab needs to be washed. And frankly, when we're home and we're throwing clothes in our washing machine anyway, I suggest doing it. Couple things with your swab. On the ends, if you see metal or it's exposed, you need to cover it. If you're good at sewing, sew something. If you're not good at sewing, you can get shrink wrap. You can buy this on Amazon. If you want a kit with all different sizes, you simply put it over. And then with a hairdryer, it will squeeze right around it and it drops through without scratching your instrument or marking anything. And it makes it go through more easily. So this is just shrink wrap tubing. It's very easy to find. It's fantastic to have for every studio teacher should have it. If you have a cork full off a key, you can put it on the back of the key. This has saved the bacon of many different players having that. It's incredibly cheap to buy. That's a lifetime supply for most players and it's probably, you know, 10 to $15 if that. My personal recommendation with swabs is to get a swab which has two ends. And the reason I say that is probably once a month I get a phone call in a panic. Usually someone's on stage where they've been pulling their swab through 
and it gets stuck on the metal tubes that are inside your bore. You may be able to, let me just see if you can sort of see them. So when they get stuck, there's usually different things that happen. There's that momentary panic. If you're at home and you're a high school student, usually you show your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your cousin, and they're getting in there with the first thing they see, which is a shun kitchen knife, um, a corkscrew, generally a pair of pliers, uh, tweezers. Uh, I've seen people use fishing weights and all kinds of creative things. The problem is that marks up your bore and basically in many cases causes huge headaches or can even destroy your instrument. So you don't want to do that. The beauty of the second end is when it goes through, if it gets stuck, you just pull it the way it was. Because when you keep pulling it the other way, it's actually making it worse. Look at your swabs. And if you have knots in them, which again, lots of people do. So you see your swab and it looks like this. Don't do it. I personally recommend changing your swab at least once a year, because again, it's removing all the saliva, which is acidic. And it, this is irrelevant whether you use a cotton or a silk swab or anything else. Swabs are basically quite inexpensive, much cheaper than having, you know, someone like me work on your instrument. The other thing is when you're getting water problems in your clarinet, it usually indicates that you're not doing a very good job of removing the water. So if the water is staying in, that can cause all kinds of things, swollen joints, parts that won't come apart or go together properly things where you get cracks. When the wood moves, you can have tuning problems. So a couple of things. No matter what make of clarinet you play, I'm going to demonstrate this on a synthetic one, but whether it's a synthetic clarinet, whether it's a wooden clarinet, whether it's your bass clarinet, swabbing, to the best of my knowledge, is not an Olympic sport. You will not get points for being the fastest person in the room or flinging around as much moisture as possible. Since the idea is to remove moisture, I would say again that usually when I see people swab, what I see is them do this. I'm not sure I'm on camera for this, but I will see them do this and they'll drop the swab through and then they'll go and that's their swab. Now the odd time, if you have two bars before a solo and you're playing in the orchestra, you may not have a choice and fair enough, it's better than nothing, but just be aware you're only basically getting a little bit of the moisture. So my suggestion when you swab is, for those of you in the South, use Mississippi. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five. And then I suggest doing it five times. And as you do it, turn the instrument slightly. So if it was hitting only on one side before, do it like this. Once you've done that, basically, you will have very, very, very little water if you look up in the board. Now, the other thing, and I'll just show you this. I'm going to do it from the bottom because it's for clarity. But if this is out, let's say I got this here and it was, oh my God, it's stuck. It's 10 bars to the solo. Right now, I can, I can see Diane's face on the screen right now and she's going, this has happened to me. This has been, it's an embarrassing moment. It's awful. It has happened to most people. Doesn't come out this way in virtually every case, it just comes out. So I love these swabs. We put them in our care kits actually because of that very thing. Um, you may want to have two swabs in any case for the average person, because for those of you that use or have wooden clarinets, we're going to talk about oiling the bore. And what I usually recommend is when you replace your swab, keep the old one, and then you use it for oiling the actual bore of the instrument. Okay. So just because we've sort of gotten to that point, I'm going to talk a little bit about oil. When you read the internet, you'll find all kinds of people who say never oil. You'll find other people who say do oil. You'll find 8,500 opinions on how to oil and what kinds of oil to use. I would suggest to you that the main reason you want to consider oiling is this, that when we blow in the instrument, we're blowing acid. This is what's used to break down food. It's quite corrosive. If you actually take a piece of metal and you just kind of put saliva on it, come back a few days later, in many cases like aluminum, you're going to see little pitting marks and all kinds of things. 
Many of you know it because when you look at your own keys, you'll see wear spots on the key from body acid, whether it's coming up through your fingers or your saliva. So if you want to minimize the effects of saliva, and saliva, the acid is stronger than wood. One of the best ways to do it is to have as little in as possible. And if you simply think of it, oil makes the surface slippery. It's one of the main reasons we use it when we cook so that the food doesn't stick. If it has oil in the residue from the oil, I find much more of the moisture we blow is falling through. That way you're getting less water in the tone holes, less water residually, which is causing you gurgles, less water to remove. So <clears throat> there's a lot, lots of opinions on different oils. I, I kind of like natural things and I'm not a big fan of petroleum distillates. And a lot of the oil you have with, with music store names, not all, but a lot of them are basically pretty similar to valve oil and all kinds of other things. And they're just, they have all kinds of additives that are not very good. I recommend natural oils usually derived from uh, nuts. There are some different things for those who may have nut allergies that I can recommend. Um, I typically recommend almond oil. This is one that we do and we put in uh, a couple of natural things that actually help it in terms of adhesion. And the way I recommend using it is, first of all, don't use it when your instrument's wet because oil and water don't really mix very well. So usually I suggest doing it at the end of the day, a few hours after practice. And I will normally recommend that someone takes a couple of pieces of paper towel and put them on something safe, not on a couch, not on the bed in your dorm room, if you can help it, where somebody may sit on it, not on the floor where your pet may lay on it and think this is a lot of fun for those of you with pets that do that sort of thing. But somewhere that's stable, it can be your kitchen counter, your kitchen table, it can be a, you know, a nice workspace you have. And because you will get some oil, just use a little paper towel on it. I like this kind of a, an applicator because it has a little spout and you can drop it and you can count drops. And I typically start by recommending six drops. Now, if your clarinet's 20 years old and you've never oiled it, you may need a little more because it's gonna be a bit thirsty, but six is usually pretty good. One joint at a time. Please don't do your mouthpiece with this. It's usually made of rubber or glass or a synthetic of some sort. Uh, the oil, won't cause it a lot of harm, but it won't be helpful uh, either. So these are typically the four parts on your wooden instrument. So barrel, bell, upper joint, lower joint. We're going to talk about doing the inside. If you get a little on the outside because it's on your hands, it doesn't really matter. Each manufacturer has their own little kind of recipe and formula for how they season the wood and what products or materials, length of time that they may oil, whether they do it under pressure, whether they do it naturally, whether they do multiple applications. But virtually uh, the greatest majority do some process of this. And again, if you think of it, especially with dust and dirt, if it stays in the tone hole, you're gonna get more water gurgles. And I think all of us want to avoid that. Oh, one trick actually for water gurgles. A lot of clarinet players who I know don't really think before they hold their clarinet. So it's in their lap or they're holding it here or it's upside down. If you're getting water in certain tone holes, like in these tone holes, when you're holding it and not playing it, you know, you have a three minute break. Uh, you're not playing in the movement if you don't have it on your stand. Hold it in the direction that the gravity will help the moisture fall away from those tone holes. Because if you do it this way, you're making the problem worse. Okay, so if we have, uh, I'm gonna use a wooden clarinet for this. Sorry, that's a, a synthetic one. So I will use in this case. Lori, can I ask you a question? No. Okay. <laughs> of course you can. We had a student post a question, um, two different things. Talk yep. Going back to swabbing. For a plastic clarinet, is it actually necessary to take it apart after every session, swab each part separately and put it into the case? Or is it sufficient to do one swab through the entire piece and let it rest on the stand? That's the first question. Good, good first question. Okay. And then the second one, would you recommend oiling the bore of a clarinet like the CG Carbon or a Buffet Green Line? Okay. So the CG Carbon and the Green Line are different and I will explain why in a second. Let me take the first question. First of all, would I take it apart? Absolutely, always and in every case. 
The only reason for not taking it apart is because you're too lazy to put it in the case. Now, I mentioned before I drive a really nice car. That really nice car, I ordered a whole bunch of options that were expensive because of the people who don't put it in the case. Because a pet goes by, a friend comes over, you forget it's there and you hit it, knock it over, break it in half. It's a bad idea, but also because Frankly, the moisture pools up in all those little joints. You know, every day on the internet in a clarinet news group or something, I hear of somebody who has their joints stuck together. Often it happens because of all that residual moisture. But here's the other real part of the problem, is when you look at a cork, even the best of corks, there are little tiny holes in it. And that acidity will go through. Now, if you have a clarinet, let me try it with this one just for a sec. If you can wobble your joint back and forth, you see visibly it moving, or if it's rocking, I virtually guarantee you folks that that cork is not sealing against air loss. If you lose 5% of your air because it's leaking, just think of it, are you such a good player? Are you 5% better than the person sitting next to you so that when 5% of your air is leaking, you can overcome that deficiency? And I would dare say no. So you want to take it apart and swab it. Now, one of the things, and it's a good question, I recommend to people that in their case, they keep a little package of tissues. Doesn't it, I think these are Kleenex, but it doesn't have to be. Just any, any brand, again, that you buy a little stack of them for the studio and everybody gets one. And I recommend that after you finish playing, if you've swabbed it all together, then you take a tissue. And particularly in the times of COVID where we're all really sensitive, Wherever there is a tenon and a socket, so the two parts that go together, in the one where there's the internal part here with a tissue, you simply go in, wipe it really well, it will remove all any residual moisture. Then with the tissue, you go into the other part, I'll use the upper tenon at this point, and you wipe it off. So you're also wiping off cork grease. Here's a secret for all of you. That tube of cork grease you have is not an investment in the future of mankind. It will not appreciate like gold. Basically, cork grease has a shelf life as well in terms of any lubricant basically loses its efficiency or its efficacy or strength or whatever you want to call it over a period of time. Treat yourself once in a while to a new tube or tub. Now, a lot of the cork greases out there Again, some of the ones you buy commercially with, you know, sort of generic store names and all, are petroleum distillates. Treat yourself to a decent cork grease. They're really, really inexpensive. They're typically under $5 and it will last you. Most of the makers whose names you recommend pay attention to what they put in their lubricants. So, you know, if you go out and you buy something, for an example, that says Vendoran or Diderio, or Bakun, or Buffet, or, you know, sort of the makers whose names you would typically recommend, you're, you're probably pretty well assured that they're reasonable products that are not gonna harm the instrument. Again, I recommend using eye makeup rem remover once in a while because all of these little holes build up with grease and all, and they go underneath. Now, the one trick I will mention to you, every clarinet player, doesn't matter, whether you play contrabass or A flat sopranino. It doesn't matter if you are a virtuoso or second week of band. Have a roll of this in your case. This is Teflon tape, it is plumber's tape. I don't know when, but I guarantee this is going to save you a huge problem and a major embarrassment. If a screw is loose, you can wrap a little piece of it or dental floss around the screw to hold it temporarily. If the tenon is wobbling, you can put this around the tenon and then basically put it together and it will seal against leaks. If your mouthpiece cork comes off before a concert, it will work. One time in my earlier life, I played bass clarinet in the opera orchestra in Vancouver amongst various other things. And I had a ligature that broke and I'm, I'm a guy that's supposed to always be prepared, right? And I didn't have a spare ligature. I had a spare mouthpiece. I had, you know, 7,433 reeds. I think I probably had, you know, 12 sets of pads, probably a heating iron, and there may have been a lathe and a milling machine in my bass clarinet case, but there was no ligature. I wrapped this around and I used it basically. Now, you can't do a quick reed change, but it worked and it actually worked pretty well um, during that. It really 
kind of saved the day. So at some point, this is going to come in incredibly handy. It's, it's cheap. You can usually go buy a roll of it for sub $1. I've seen it at 39 cents. But this is one of those things in your desert island kit that you want to have. Okay, great. Hey, Maury, there's another question from one of our watchers. If, uh, if I could read this to you. Sure. Okay. Do you know if the Manig recipe oil is natural nut and other oils or synthetic? So first of all, during Manig's time, and for those of you that don't know, Manig refers to Hans Manig, who was a really, really famous repairman who worked in Philadelphia. And basically for many, many years, a lot of famous players whose names you know, people like Harold Wright and Robert Marcellus and Tony Gioiotti and just people who are legendary went to him and he was a guru. You'd make appointments. I, I could tell you all kinds of stories about Manning, but I will give you one really fast one. Part of the reason I do what I do today is when I was young, Ron DeCant, who was the principal clarinet in the Vancouver Symphony and a very well-respected, very high-end clarinetist in his day, I was meeting with, and he, he was a pilot as well. He'd just flown back from Philadelphia where he had gotten a set of clarinets, of new clarinets, which Manig had set up. And he gave them to me to hold and said, what do you think of the feel? And I remember the moment today, and this is now, you know, over 40 years ago, 45 years ago. I remember it as being one of the profound moments in my life where I'd never felt anything like this the evenness, the fluidity, the, the beautiful crispness of the action, the speed that things moved. And I, I said, how did he do that? And he said, well, that's the Manig magic. And I, at that moment, I knew I wasn't quite sure the path my life would take because I was playing a lot in those days. But I knew that I would spend my life trying to find that secret. So when I hear Manig's name, it's always a, a heartwarming moment. So Manig, was a person much like a player. If you play the Mozart Concerto 10 times, you don't always do it the same way. So throughout Manning's career, he was always trying to improve and he used different things. Like he used orange peels in the case to control humidity. He used different oils, nut derived oils and some other things at different times. But I've read different formulas which he used at different times. And in my experience, he was always experimenting. But much of the time he was using nut based oils as well. Um, and remember in those days, there weren't as many synthetics and unnatural things as there are today. You know, today you can go to um, a Walmart and you look at the auto section and you will see hundreds of selections of different oils, synthetics and other things. All you need to do is go to a cooking store and you'll see 700 kinds of oil with and without additives. So the the Manig oil, depending on which formula, and if they want to email me offline, I'll tell them which one and I'm happy to give advice. The second part of that question, I think, was oiling a CG or oiling the green line. Again, if you think of the two reasons I gave to me for oiling, one of them is to keep the water from pooling up and to make it go through so you get less water in the tone holes. I still recommend the oil, but if it's got a bore like the Green Line, and for those of you that don't know, Green Line refers to a product which Buffet designed, I, I think it was kind of roughly 10 years ago, but I'm not sure of the exact time frame, which is a mix. It has grenadilla dust and then various other materials that they put in and then form under pressure to make the billets of wood which they cut, with the idea of being there's less change in the wood and ultimately less cracking in the wood there's still a wooden component. So I still recommend it in terms of the saliva going through the bore. Now on the CG clarinet, which was referred to, and that's the Corrado Giuffredi model, which Bakun makes, it has a carbon fiber outside, so it looks very high tech, but the whole inside is a wooden bore. So again, if you're a player like uh, Jose Frank Biester, for example, plays on that instrument, or Corrado Giuffredi who plays on that instrument, because of the wooden bore, I would recommend with that one, you use the same amount of oil, which would be the six drops. On a green line, I would recommend cutting it in half, just because it, there's not as much wood to absorb it in terms of that, okay? So when you oil, did, sorry, did that Denise sort of address that question, Diane? Okay, 
So when you oil the instrument, you use your spare swab and you simply put on a half dozen drops of the oil. Then I rub the swab together to distribute it. Then again, I do this now piece by piece. So let's say it's the lower joint. I would drop this through. And at this point, I do it at about half the speed of a normal swab. So just kind of very slowly pull it through. And again, wherever you're working, have a paper towel because you will get a couple of drips. So don't do it over your favorite computer um, while lying you know, on the couch watching Netflix or something. And then you do it again each time. At the end of it, then take it with your finger with the oily swab and again on the inside tenon and on the outside tenon, make sure there's oil. And you'll know that it's right because when you look up into the light, you should look at it before and you'll see there's grain in the wood and usually there's a little grayness and, and some dull spots. When it's finished, you want it to have a nice even sheen without any visible dry spots. Now, please don't worry that you can overdo this. With this particular oil, particularly bottle of size, if you use the whole thing, all it would get would be slightly slippery and it would still absorb. You would just wipe it off with a paper towel. I usually recommend also under areas where you touch, like under the thumb rest, it tends to get very dry on a lot of clarinets. You can feel it gets rough and, and all. At those points, also, I'll usually rub a little of the oil on which absorbs in. Then I simply put it down on the cloth and leave it overnight. Go wash your hands. In in a few of the studios that I've worked with, they actually do oiling sessions once every quarter, once every semester, where they'll have the whole studio together and they'll buy one bottle of almond oil, for example, for $6 and everybody kicks in their 30 cents or whatever. They bring their extra swab and they all do it together. Now, one of the other areas that often gets overlooked is inside these open holes where your fingers go, they also get dry and often clarinets will get chimney cracks and different things. So I also will go in again with a little Q-tip in this case and just oil the inside of those. You don't need to do metal tubes. So the thumb tube here, for example, unnecessary for that. Do it in each section and then simply leave it. In the morning, if you've left it overnight, in the morning when you wake up, just take the instrument swab it with the dry swab very well several times so you've looked at it first it's nice and shiny just make sure there's no dripping or anything and you can then put it together and play it i recommend at that point also putting on fresh cork grease just because you've probably taken the time to clean off whatever is on there and again whether your clarinet's new or old i want you to think of the cork as being it needs to be supple and resilient and some people say, oh, my clarinet's three years old. It goes together easily. I don't need to use it. It's a little like skin. Baby skin is very soft. It's very supple. It's very malleable. Sometimes as people get older, although none of those are on this call, clearly. Skin tends to get a little drier. It gets a little harder. And I know these days, in my case, because I'm washing my hands even more than I normally might, it gets dried out. The cork grease helps to lubricate those. So when they go together, it seals them quite well and will help with that. It also can extend the life of the cork. And given that it's a bit of a pain these days to go into repair shops uh, and sometimes more challenging. In our case, for an example, we have COVID protocols. So if you want your clarinet worked on, you can't come in the shop because we have protocols, you have to ship it. Then there is a period where it waits. There's a disinfecting process. It's worked on, then it comes back and we suggest that people wait. It can be longer. So anything we can do to keep our instruments in better shape right now is probably time well spent. And it gets you closer to your instrument while you're doing this, folks. Take the time to really look at it and say, are there any little lines or cracks? Are there any, any marks? Are there keys that are getting really loose? You can get to know your instrument quite well. And if you notice things like that, just take a little notebook and write them down. So if there's a line that you think is suspicious, you're not sure if it's a crack. For an example, you can take a pencil, mark one end and the other end, and then keep an eye on it. And if you see it getting longer, then it's probably not grain. It's a really helpful, very simple thing that you can all do. You know, it's sort of like your doctor will say, do these things to look after your health, and then there's things the doctor does. Same in this case. If you're not sure if it's a crack, you know, there's different ways to tell. Now, one thing I am gonna mention 
for all of us, when we go into repair shops, normally we go in and we're getting our clarinets checked. So there are a few ways to check for leaks. One of them is people will use feeler gauges, which can be made of cellophane or cigarette paper. I like dental occlusal paper because it's very thin. Or there are some people who go and they'll suck on it and say that, oh, it's great because they've sucked on it. And there's other people who use a machine where the machine has different ways to calibrate it and then it reads exactly how much air is leaking. Most people call those magnahelic or air testing. A couple of things. First of all, if you go to someone who sucks on the clarinet, it's a fantastic test. As long as when you play the clarinet, you suck on it. If you suck on it, and I can see, you know, Diane is kind of laughing, then it's a great test. But it's, it's sort of like sucking on your garden hose and saying, oh yeah, this one's great. It's, it, the, the information, while maybe it's better than nothing, is not very good. The feeler gauge gives you very precise information about individual pads, but the air machine does a few things which are great. For an example, and I'll show you something. Every repair person I know, when they suck on it, they suck on the upper joint. But I've never seen one who sucks on the barrel to see if there's a leak. And I've never seen one who puts them together and tests the two. So you, if you use the air machine, you can test both of these together or the upper and the lower joint. And I always try and tell a player, for example, okay, in the upper joint, you have half a pound and we'll keep a record of that. So we really know if it's starting to change. So when you as a player come back and, you know, if Diane, for example, say, hey, Maury, my clarinet was playing great and it's not playing great. Well, if I worked on that one before, as an example, and I said, okay, there was half a pound and now there's two pounds, very quickly, we've already diagnosed where, you know, the issue is probably coming in, then it's more a matter of just finding it and trying to resolve that particular problem. I also advise when you're oiling, do the inside of the bell, including the tannin, and the barrel gets more saliva than anything but the mouthpiece, because the mouthpiece is not usually a product of nature. It's not directly affected in the same way. So often you will find the barrel needs a little more oiling or a little more frequent oiling than the rest of it does. But just look inside. And if it looks gray and the wood's looking really grainy, it's kind of saying, mommy, feed me or daddy, feed me. So just give it a little oil. You are, you are not going to hurt it unless you use something like a petroleum distill. Now, after you oil, Maury, can what? I can I just uh, interrupt for just a minute? No, so we're, we're eight. We're ah, we're eighteen minutes out. Just because okay. you wanted to know that, and Thank we you. do have two questions. Can I pose those to you? You can. Um, Let me just do this at the same time, just so I don't forget. After you oil in the swab, wash your swab, and then put it away, and even in a Ziploc bag, write the date, and then you'll even know the last time you you did it. Please. Proceed okay. with your questions. Somebody wanted to ask, do you need to protect the pads from the oil before pulling the swab through when you oil the instrument? Beautiful question. So if you have the more modern style pads, which are Valentino pads or any of the synthetic leathers, they can be Gore-Tex or the waterproof, typically not. But if you do, then all, if you have bladder skin pads, it's a good idea to do it. Cork pads, again, are largely unaffected by oil. Just get some kitchen towel, cut little squares like this, put them under the pad. Now the other thing, folks, these are fantastic. If you do these and you cut a little bunch like this, this is actually from Costco, it's called shop towel. It's incredibly absorbent. And a lot of good players I know will get this now in a sheet or two and they cut them up and they leave them in the, like 20 or 30 in their case. And whenever they get water in a tone hole, they put them under. It's much more absorbent than cigarette paper and it doesn't cause any stickiness. So a great trick is just to take these and leave them in. And if you have a really, really, um, just one pad, two pads that just always wanna stick or always get water, I know a number of players who will do that and then they leave it when it's in the case and it really absorbs all the moisture. Pull it out. But that will protect if you have an, uh, like a, traditional clarinet that comes with what are called bladder skin or fish skin pads. It's a good idea. Thanks for that. Good question. 
Perfect. Another question is why is it commonly taught to swab the rest of the clarinet without the mouthpiece on? Is it that the mouthpiece should not be swabbed or that the mouthpiece needs a swab of a different material? Or that the twisty of a large swab is too hard on the mouthpiece? Or... <laughs> All, all good points and basically all valid. So a couple of things. Number one, you know, swabs are typically pretty big. So the, with the swabs, probably half the ones I see have pretty rough metal ends on them um, where they've poked through the fabric or the cloth or different things. So again, you can use some heat shrink tubing, but you don't really need a bazooka for something that size. I recommend typically, you know, there's a number of people who make now mouthpiece swabs and all. You can get them in music stores, some decent ones, which are much smaller. They're handy. But again, even your package of tissues, if I, for an example, use this, and I will just take a mouthpiece here. So if I want to get into the bore, I can use this and get in very easily, take it the same, and then I can throw the tissue away, and it's really, really clean. Again, it's kind of hygienic to do, and I find you can get to it. Now, if you're trying to avoid on the outside the white, the calcium buildup or the greenish buildup and different things, there are different ways to do that. And I'll take just a minute here to explain. A lot of that is a calcium buildup, and some people have a lot of it. There's other people I know who get almost none. So, for example, this is Mary's mouthpiece she plays, and it looks like the day that it was made, even though she's played it you know, for all kinds of professional work. If I play the same mouthpiece for a couple of weeks, I start to get a buildup and scale and, and different things because my body chemistry is different than her body chemistry. If you get that, one of the very easy tricks is you can take a small cup and you can fill it with lemon juice will work, uh, vinegar will work, sort of 50-50 vinegar and water. You can let it soak. I usually recommend don't soak the cork because sometimes it can make the cork come loose. Not often, but it does happen. So just do the actual part of the mouthpiece, sort of the top half, which you blow in, uh, where your mouth would typically go around as part of the embouchure. And after that, then you can usually wipe it off. If it's really nasty, it's been there eight years, 10 years, 15 years. I've seen some that, you know, basically short of a, a sanding belt in an industrial hazmat suit, you're not going to get that stuff off. Uh, if it's that way, you may need to do it several times, but typically once we'll do it. Here's a trick though. If you want to really enjoy your mouthpiece and love it, rather than normal white vinegar, use some balsamic vinegar, please not the hundred year old Italian stuff that costs $400, but it, it is so delicious. It really is fantastic. Uh, the taste is better and it still does a great job of removing the, the material. And you can use 50-50. You can play around a bit because you can use less if you don't have much uh, of the buildup in terms of that. You may need to do it just a, a couple of times, but that, that will work really well. So when you swab your mouthpiece after you play, the other reason I don't like it is because the mouthpiece has more moisture in it than anything else. So you're taking this swab, which is now really wet, and it's got all this stuff we're blowing, particularly in times of COVID. And most people put their swab in where their instrument is and the case lining. You start getting mold and all kinds of stuff. Okay? If you have a wet swab, folks, first of all, especially in these times, I would suggest keep a Ziploc bag or something and put your swab in that. Don't put it when it's wet against the instrument. And store it, if you can, in your outer pouch or your backpack or wherever you feel you need to, but not inside. And particularly, do not take it and stuff it in the bell. That's really an invitation for just a science experiment gone wrong. You, you know, unless you want to be read about on the news as being the new super spreader of whatever you have, you know, whether it's the flu, malaria, uh, you know, boigo boigo disease, don't do it. Okay. Does that answer the question? I believe it did. Um, okay. We have somebody else who said, does it matter if the water, and I think this is when you were talking about the mouthpiece, um, if the water is distilled due to tap water, sometimes having minerals, et cetera, in them. Yeah, you know, I don't tend to think of that a lot, only because in our case, where, where I live in Vancouver, Canada, we're fortunate that because we have a lot of mountains and, and natural water that's quite clean, the water here is actually of a very good quality. But if you're suspicious about the water, then I would just use bottled water or distilled water 
for that because again it's plentiful it's cheap if it's a concern then then i would do that uh, the other thing which i would say is when you're washing your swabs if you use some fabric softener uh, it actually gives it a very very nice smell and it also tends to make the swabs more absorbent and usually when you do them do them in a delicate bag because otherwise you can get the cords really caught up. One time my wife was washing a number of swabs and it took about a week to get them all untangled. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you end up, you know, with three swabs you throw away because you, you're frustrated. So it's a, it's a good, good handy trick to wrap them around and, and do it, okay? Good, Sorry. so we're 20 minutes out. Um, okay. I would ask what, anybody 20 minutes listening. Or 10 minutes? I'm sorry, 10 minutes. Okay. If we, it, sorry, that's what, that was a Freudian slip of wishful thinking that we had 20 more minutes. So, um, if, yes, please go ahead. So two things I just wanted to touch on. For those of you that play clarinet who play an A and a B flat clarinet, do them both at the same time so that you remember and keep, keep the date that you do all these sorts of things. Same thing when you go in for repairs. If you have a repair person, and I encourage all of you to find a repair person who you're comfortable with and you trust and you know talk to friends or colleagues people who you admire and respect about people they use you know you want to build a relationship and it's just like you may go to a dentist and you say well they're probably a good dentist but they may not be the right person for me you want to find that mix where someone wants to understand what you need and keep track of things like the touch you like the feel the way you want it to play i recommend in most cases people have bought their a and their b flat at different times and they're at different points in their evolution. One may be three years old, one may be a year old. And they kind of feel different. As you establish a relationship with whoever you use for a technician, have them set up your B flat and A so that when you go between the two, the tendencies are as close as possible. So the spring pressure, key height where possible, spacing of keys, things like if a note on one is five or 10 cents sharp, and you should all have a notebook. So you really know your instrument, like is the tendency of a note flat or sharp? You can say to those people, can you match them? So when you're picking up your A, you're not having to spend two thirds of your time saying, oh, my F on this one's flat and my F on the other one's sharp, which you will forget and screw up. So if you make that kind of sacred trust with a technician where you can tell them your challenges or your worry, they will ultimately be able to help you to meet your objectives by matching your instruments much more closely. Doesn't mean you can get them exactly the same, but even things like the height of your thumb rest, you can get them where the feel is much, much more similar. The other thing I would advise for lots of you, on the back with a little piece of tape or a yellow or a red dot or something, put it on because every one of you at some point in your development is gonna pick up your A clarinet and come in on a great B flat solo or vice versa. I know one particular person who went out to play the Mozart concerto with the top part of their B flat on the bottom part of their A clarinet, and they were already out on stage when they started. So by simply marking them or color, you know, two little colored dots, you can avoid the problem. Little, Good little help tip. Little, Good little, tip. little help, yeah. But it happens to virtually everybody. The other thing I just wanted to touch on very briefly is pad types. And we may not have time for a comprehensive discussion here, but there are lots of lots of different discussions about pads. And you'll see people who are adamant, you can only use cork pads, or you can only use Valentino, or you can only use bladder, or you can only use um, Gore-Tex, or you can only use uh, leather. And, and you'll have different people who have different strengths and weaknesses. Try and you know educate yourself as best you can on the differences between them. There is no one type of pad that's perfect for everybody, and they all have sort of strengths or weaknesses. Some last longer, some don't. Some have different tendencies in terms of their sound. But what I would say is if you look at your clarinet and it's a patchwork quilt, where you've got one fish skin that's the original and two cork and three three leather pads and one made out of um, Aunt Mabel, you know, knit you one when it fell out before the concert. And one is chewing gum, but you can't quite remember if it was, you know, Juicy Fruit or Wrigley's uh, spearmint flavor, but you put it in, you know, three months ago. It's probably time to have that attended to. Pads will last different lengths of time. If you take better care of your clarinet, they last longer. For those of you with higher acidity, they typically will last less time. I've seen people go through sets of pads in a year. I've seen other ones who can play 10 year old pads that still seal moderately well, usually not perfectly. The other giveaway is if a pad's getting really noisy when you're trilling a key, usually it means the pad surface is hard and that's giving you an indication that it's time to at least keep an eye on it in terms of that. 
Uh, let's see, anything else on uh, my list? Um, I had some other things on tuning and voicing and, and adjusting, but I don't think we're gonna have time to get into those. Sorry, sorry for that. If there's any other questions though, I'm happy to address them. I can't see who's on. Anyone? Denise? I don't okay, there was, there was a question about the almond oil. Sure. Um, somebody said, uh, would that mean almond oil specifically for a clarinet or a type oh. of cooking oil? Yeah, so I typically tell people, if you go into a health food store, they normally have almond oil that's just pure, but you can use it for cooking. And in fact, I recommend it highly in your next batch of chocolate chip cookies. So for the average person, a bottle like this would last five years. Now, a couple of things, oils don't last that long. So they are light sensitive. So after you've opened it, keep it in a desk drawer or a shelf, or if you have to keep it out because you just don't have storage space, wrap something like some towel around it. When you get the bottle, write the date on it. So once it's passed a couple of years, get rid of it in terms of, of what that will do. Uh, but just pure almond oil that you use for cooking or typically I think it's used more for baking. Uh, you know, people are making almond croissant, also very mm -hmm. delicious incidentally. I can send you a recipe that, you know, you'll, you'll like for that. But a bottle this size will last, you know, typically in your studio would probably be enough for certainly a semester, even if, if you know, 20 kids were there and, and using it, right? So for an example, I'm looking over Diane's shoulder and I see on her music stand, her swab. A bunch of stands, oh, yeah, a right. bunch of swabs. Right, yeah. so those things are out. And again, whatever's in there, <laughs> dust, dirt, all that stuff is on those things. And that's part of the reason we want to take the time to wash them. But also when I look at the size of those, I wouldn't personally want, want to pull that through a mouthpiece because you look at it and think, yeah. mm, just, a little, little bit, you know, large for that purpose. Right. In terms of that. Maury, this hey. is so great today. Can Vacuum we your cases. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, um, we're, we're going to be doing this again the first weekend in March. And boy, love, would love for you to come do a part two, um, if you would think about it and consider it, because you have so much great information to offer us. And I really appreciate your time today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Next time we'll do a little work and actually show you things like how to change a pad or a cork and, and some other things. If any of you would, you know, if you have questions that you were either a little shy or there just wasn't a chance to get to, you're welcome to send send them. My address is Maury, M-O-R-R-I-E, at bakunmusical.com, B-A-C-K-U-N-M-U-S-I-C-A-L.com. Um, if I don't get back immediately, I will try my best to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, in the meantime, stay safe, be healthy, practice your clarinet, vacuum your cases, and thank you so much to Denise and Diane who are great supporters in the clarinet world, wonderful teachers and artists for doing this and sharing their love of the instrument and knowledge. And for each of you, best of luck in your clarinet journeys. Thanks for all of us at Bakun. It was a pleasure to spend this time together. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. More than welcome. <laughs> Oh my Thanks, God. Folks. Thank you, everybody, for attending. It was great. And we're going to try to get Maury back for for March, our next Amakitia Clarinet Extravaganza week, uh, weekend. So stay tuned. Thank you, everybody. Yay. Be well. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.